Welcome back to the channel, everybody. Well, it's that time. It's time for the Patreon requested video where one of my fabulous people over on Patreon make a suggestion about what they would like to see this month. And this month's suggestion comes from Christina. Christina recently acquired one of, well, her first real radioactive specimen, although it'd be a little by accident. She does have it now, and she had a couple of questions. And well, this is a perfect opportunity to delve into the world of radioactive rocks and minerals, because they are very fun. I enjoy them. I have, I have, I have some. I'm not like a big collector, but I do find it to be a fascinating topic. And while we're on the subject some, we're also going to be talking a little bit about the color green, specifically fluorescence, as there is a common uh, thing that is said in the rock world about fluorescence that is green always being caused by uranium. And while that might be a little true, it's a little bit of a misleading characterization of it. So we're going to be talking about that as well. So... With that said, we're going to head over to the bench. We're going to start looking at some specimens. And, uh, well, you might hear this guy uh, clicking around in the background, and we'll talk about this, too. So right here, we have three different things. We have a thunder egg from the Lucky Strike Mine in Oregon. We have a thunder egg from the Dugway Geode Beds. Yes, they, and we're not going to get into that, but they are, in fact, thunder eggs and not geodes. Whole other topic. And we have some opal here. So we're going to shut the lights off real quick, and I'll just give you a glance at this. We'll... So you can see that under a shortwave light, these are very fluorescent. Very, very fluorescent. Very green, especially this opal. Here in Northeast Washington, my general background radiation was just out and about in life is around 20 counts per minute. Now, doubling that to about 40 counts per minute is still definitely in that normal range. Now I'm using counts per minute as opposed to all of the other measurements for radiation because the CPM measures the ion number of ionizing events per minute and uh, as opposed to like sieverts, we have all these different methods of measurement. And this is uh, just kind of the way <laughs> The way we do it in the rock and mineral collecting world, we use counts per minute. You could have a, an entire video on the subject of uh, like radiation and all the different me methods of measurement that have been used over time. Um, I'm, I, we use counts per minute. So, um, peaking here at 55 counts per minute on some opal, is perfectly fine. These thunder eggs in the background have such small trace amounts of uranium in it that uh, my little tiny Geiger counter here, which I know um, is not the best Geiger counter in the world, it's the main downside to it is that it's slow in its reaction time. Well, um, it, it cannot even detect. So that's one of the, th the things with fluorescent rocks is that we're looking at excited trace elements. So although when, if I was to take this and have it scanned using like an XRF, we could probably see these elements, maybe. Um, that might be sensitive enough, but we're talking about very minimal, minimal radiation, even though it glows green under UV light. A lot of the specimens that you're about to see now are approaching, slowly approaching, what I would consider a dangerous level of radiation. And for me, um, you know, your mileage might vary. I start doing safe handling practices of radioactive stuff at around 2,000 and up counts per minute. And when I say safe handling, I mean, I, I put some uh, safety mitts on so that cross-contamination doesn't happen. And I also store them away from my the rest of my collection. I just have an ammo can here, and that's what I keep a lot of my specimens in. And of course, that is labeled, because you want to label your storage so that people know what it is that you're, uh, well, you have. Because like Christina, you might inadvertently end up with uh, some specimens that you didn't uh, necessarily want. 
Here is uh, some of my very local radioactive specimens from the Daybreak Mine. We have some Autonite here, and uh, it is very, very fluorescent. Very fluorescent stuff. I'll put the lights here real quick. Just a couple of them, and you can check that out a little bit better. Very fluorescent stuff. All right, so you can kind of see that we've uh, started to peek out a little bit here. We're in that, you know, 6,000, probably jump up into the sevens. Okay. Um, that's a little, I find the clicking a little annoying. <laughs> um, but that is uh, just stuff that can be found locally here. And as you can see, even just the smallest amount of distance, and we start to dramatically drop off. These are beautiful little crystals in here. I have this guy micro-mounted up here. And, you know, even just a little, a little piece will start sending the counter up. You know, it's important to point out that the average nuclear industry worker gets far more radiation than me and you owning some specimens. You can have these in your space just fine. And as you can see here, uh, in a jar, the Geiger counter just uh, a mere six, eight inches away, totally fine. Totally fine, no problems there. I think the problem comes when things are not labeled appropriately. As you can see here in this, we have dust. And that is the thing that you want to avoid with all of this, is having a dusty environment, that, that cross-contamination. Let this guy pop up here for a minute. This material is from Utah, by the way. Well, you get the picture. Storage and labels, pretty easy. I would gladly keep these in my house. Things that you definitely want to avoid are things like this. Like this is a little Americium 241 button that I ripped out of a smoke detector. And the dangerous part with this is that it does not look dangerous at all. Okay, that's the problem with stuff like this. Now that unlabeled is a little bit of a problem. So, you know, um, things like this, we can generally say are, are fine. A little tiny button, less fine. Christina, I hope you found this to be helpful. Uh, so yeah, put your Geiger counter into counts per minute, you know, uh, and then you can kind of pull it away from your specimens and you can kind of see what a safe distance is. You know, truly hot specimens, like in that 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 counts per minute, one thing that people will do is they'll actually make specific display cases that have shielding in them, you know, lead, concrete, things like that, and then uh, angle a series of mirrors so that you're viewing the specimen indirect or indirectly while having shielding between you and the specimen. Now, uh, I don't usually recommend people get stuff of that toasty as opposed to these very mild things like I have and like Christina has when, you know, her piece of uh, autonite is in that 2,000 to 7,000 counts per minute. If you are interested in this subject, and I certainly hope you are because you made it this far in the video, um, Uranium and Fluorescent Minerals is a good book. Introduction to Radioactive Minerals is a good book. And The Mineralogy of Uranium and Thorium is a good book. Although this one is a little like, uh, it's heavy. <laughs> it's heavy. If you're an amateur like me, it's heavy. And uh, The Care and Feeding of Radioactive Specimens is a free PDF. I will put that down below and you can go check that one out as well. That's a great resource for the amateur collector. The amateur collector. Well, let me know if I got anything wrong. You know, we're not uh, deep diving into the world of particles and ionizing events and alpha, betas, and gammas and all that stuff that you could 
totally nerd out about, and maybe we will in a future video, but this is a handy guide for people that have inadvertently or uh, decided to collect some fun radioactive specimens and uh, so keep everything safe and clean and labeled. Well, uh, thank you to everybody over on Patreon. If you want to support this project, you could do so by heading on over to Patreon. If you cannot financially support the Currently Rock Hunting project, I totally get it. If you could give me a thumbs up, a subscribe, hey, and maybe even share the videos, I would really appreciate it. And with that said, we'll leave this one here, and I'll catch you on the next video.